Well, I'm back from Australia, Bangkok. I'll talk a little bit about that in a while. I feel like God has something to say about that for you. And, um, but uh, I wanted to just preface um, what I feel is actually the message. I want to preface with a couple things because they're coming up, and I want you to understand why we partner with these things. Um, I, I want to talk about God being the master of time. And this is just kind of a preface, okay? God being the master of time. Now, let me ask everybody here, have you ever wasted a whole day? Okay? Have you, have you felt like you are not getting done in a day what needs to be done? <laughs> just me? Am I the only one? Okay, all right. Yeah, all right. Okay. And what happens is when, when that is happening, it causes us a lot of anxiety. And I, I really believe the, the Holy Spirit, just again, in this preface, he just wants to, to do a quick um, uh, thing with you to help you understand timing and how to get the timing of the Lord, okay? Um, and, and you'll be surprised that getting the timing of the Lord begins with praying at night, When you pray at night, he orders your daylight. Let's see what the Bible says about time. 2 Peter 3.8. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Other scriptures about time, I, I don't know if I gave them or not. Psalm 31, 15 to 16. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies, from those who persecute me. Um, uh, Number uh, The second one is Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 11a. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. He's made everything beautiful in its time. Uh, Revelations 1, 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. In other words, God starts the thing and he finishes the thing. I feel that's for you, Joseph. That you need to know that God will finish what he started in you. You will finish well. You will finish your race. You will run to the end. You'll breathe your last serving Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay, and so, so with that, you know, just understand that he is the master of time, and he is the God of all time, and he starts things, he stops things, he has seasons, you know, and all of that. Um, you know, that, that there is a, a, a thing about learning how to align to his timing. And the way we align to his timing is aligning to the timing of prayer. There actually is a timing of prayer. Did you know that the Jewish day starts at 6 o'clock or starts at sundown? The day starts at sundown, not when the, the light comes out. It actually starts at sundown. And then historically, there are what we call prayer watches that actually begin at sundown. Okay, and they, each one, if you uh, correlate them, I'm going to recommend a book to you. I don't have time to give, give all this to you. But each, each time frame actually has specific things that happen. You can correlate it to the Bible, uh, things that happen specifically during these particular time frames, that when we are praying through these time frames, we can trust the Lord to, to, to bring in certain blessings into our life. Let me give you a few examples. And I, I got this from Chuck Pierce's book, Reordering Your Day. Um, uh, we have the, the evening uh, prayer time, 6 to 9, 9 to 12, uh, uh, 12 to 3, 3 to 6. And for us, we actually pray once a month, 24 hours. That's the first Friday of each month. Uh, King David established 24-7 prayer, which is amazing. Uh, but what we're learning is that it has to do with watching with the Lord, and when we watch, uh, when we when we watch for the Lord, we actually He actually comes. Okay, we actually encounter His presence because we have watched for Him. Amen. And so we learned that there's different times. The first watch, 6 to 9 p.m., that's a time where we re regroup and we still ourselves before the Lord. Genesis 24, 63. Some of you single people will like this. Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. We're talking about the 6 to 9 p.m. He lifted his eyes, and what did he see? Rebecca. <laughs> um, second watch, 9 to 12, which we call the midnight watch, uh, Psalm 1, 19, 62. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments, okay? Um, and so it's like a time of thanksgiving, a time of visitation when God makes a change. Third watch, 12 to 3, is the breaking of the day, the crowing of the rooster. This is my watch. This is a watch that whenever I'm here, 
Uh, if I'm not traveling out, I actually do this watch because this is the one I need the most. Um, there's a lot of spiritual activity during that watch. This is when Peter actually denied Christ. And so if you have a problem with denying Christ, doubting him, um, losing your faith in the Lord, this is the watch for you. And it also deals with covenant-breaking spirits, where you break covenant with the Lord, when you break covenant with each other, 12 to 3. That's the one you need to be in. Uh, the fourth watch, 3 to 6, we call that the morning watch. Um, that would be uh, Psalm 35, joy comes in the morning. Um, Isaiah 54, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to, be, to hear as the learned. So that morning watch is when we hear the Lord. That morning watch is when joy comes, okay? And so we pray into that watch for those specific things because that's the timing, that's the timing, okay? And so you say, well, how do you know which watch is your watch? What's well, the watch you're always waking up for in the middle of the night? Are you a 3 a.m. or a 2 a.m. or a 4 a.m. or? You know what I'm saying? You know that, that time where you, wa you wake up every single night or every other night at that time? That's the Lord. <laughs> that's your watch. That's your watch. Okay, because that's what's needed. You say, I've always had that 12 to 3. That has always been the struggle time for me. So I watch 12 to 3. I just know. I've done this for, for years now. Um, uh, so we do have night watch prayer. First Friday downtown, first Friday of each month. It starts at, uh, we actually start at 7 uh, with worship. We just have straight worship, 7 to 9. And then we start the prayer shifts. Um, and we go all the way to the next day until 7 o'clock. And you can actually hop in at any time. You don't have to feel obligated to do a whole shift if that's, you know, too much for you. But I recommend that you come to that. And I wanted to give you just a sneak peek of why we pray during certain time frames. And there's a book that I want you to get by Chuck Pierce called Reordering Your Day. That will give you a lot more meat into why we pray at certain times and why we align to certain timings, okay? All right, so let me get into what, what I want to really talk about tonight. Let's look at 2 Chronicles 7.14. It says, if my people, let's read it together. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. I love this verse, okay? It's just, it just says how the goodness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, you know, that, that uh, uh, his his people. He, he gives it to his people, okay, that they can actually humble. We can actually humble ourselves. We can pray. We can seek the face of God. We make the decision to turn from our wicked ways, and God does a, a, a work of healing. He forgives. He heals. Um, he hears. Amen? And so it's, it's just, you know, I love this statement. And then I, I love especially the end part, healing the land. What do you mean the land needs to be healed? Does land needs to be healed? It actually needs to be healed. Land actually needs to be healed. I don't know if you ever saw the story. I forget. Uh, it was the story about what happened in Almolonga. I forget the country, but I think that's the city name of this Spanish country. Almolonga. And what happened is the whole city was drunk and, and you know, not serving the Lord. Actually, they served a deity. Um, it was a be a uh, a substitute for the god of mammon, which would be a demon of money, okay? And they would actually cut covenant with the deity and, you know, for, for money. And so um, if, if, I have my, if I have my demons right, I think that's right. I could be wrong. I could be mixing up in the story. I've been, you know, it's, it's been a wild couple of weeks. So anyway, so um, it might not have been a mammon deity, but they were cutting, cutting covenant with it. Let's put it that way, okay? But I, I, I think it was. And so... Um, uh, what happened is, um, uh, you know, there was, a Christ there was some Christians there, but they were really being spiritually oppressed, and the whole environment was being oppressed. And so what happened is the church began to pray. The church began to stand for revival. The church began to humble themselves, pray, seek God's face, turn from their wicked ways. And you know what happened? God heard. God heard, he forgave the sin, and began to heal their land. And so by the time it was all over, well, number one, um, uh, they, you know, the, a lot of the bars shut down because, you know, the people uh, stopped drinking like they were. And then the other thing that showed up in their agriculture was they had supersized crops. I'm not talking like you have a big carrot. I'm talking carrots the size of your arm. 
Okay, and it's 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 recorded. Okay, that that all of this happened to their vegetables. Their vegetables are like super size. You know, like let's say hypothetically, you had a tomato, it'd be the size of your head. I'm not exaggerating. It was like huge crops, and they kept spinning, turning the crops over, turning the crops over, um, and so they got very wealthy because of the Lord. Because when the Lord heals the land, the church begins to prosper. Some of us wonder, what's the problem? The problem is the land's not healed. The land's not healed, okay? And then what we have to recognize is sometimes healing the land is a process. And this is where, American church, if I could talk to you about the spirit of the matter. We have been so programmed to think logically and rationally that we do not understand spiritual things. And we dismiss them. We think it's crazy. We think you're out to lunch, you charismatic, you Pentecostal weirdo. I'm here to tell you the spiritual realm is calling the shots on your life whether you like it or not. And if you don't understand it, you're going to get kicked by it. Okay, because Satan is a thief, and if he knows that you're ignorant, he's going to take advantage of it. And so we have to begin to learn, hear the stories, not reject it, check it out with the Bible, look for the fruit of it. I'm not saying to follow everything that everybody says. I'm not saying to be, you know, um, a, a blinded by that. But I am saying that God, who is spirit, who gave to us his Holy Spirit, is telling us we need to understand the spirit of the matter. So healing the land is very spiritual. It is first spiritual before it is natural. Every time, okay? Every time. Uh, years ago when I was here, I've shared this story before, but years ago um, we started praying here one hour a week, okay, and, and um, you know, praying together as a church. And it's amazing what happens if you just come together and start praying just a little bit, whether it's in your household or as a church, um, what God begins to do. Um, and so what happened is we begin to pray, and I begin to notice the, the feeling of like a grip on my head when we would pray together as a church. It's kind of a feeling, you know, like a vice grip on my head. And I noticed it was, you know, it wasn't going away. It was getting stronger and stronger and worse and worse. So by the gift of discerning of spirits, everybody say gift of discerning of spirits. That's in 1 Corinthians 12. That's where the Holy Spirit allows you to know what spirit you are dealing with and even why, okay? And so I realized that I was dealing with a demonic spirit. I was in like a contention with it. I didn't start it, but, you know, Holy Spirit began to pick a fight. And when he does that, it's, it's for the purpose of victory. And that will happen to intercessors. And so it was an occultic spirit that actually was sitting, seated on the north side of our city, okay? And um, at, that, at the particular time, the north side of our city was just fields, there's nothing there. It was all barren. There's, you know, just just fields. And so I felt this contention for several weeks, several weeks. It was really deep contention. And that's what we would call spiritual warfare. They say spiritual warfare. Okay, that's Ephesians 6. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Powers, principalities, you know, and on and on. Okay, that that's our first battle. And yet we are taught the armor of God so that we can stand. And guess what? Jesus fully plans to have victory through you. Okay? And so, um, you know, and these are things we learn as we move forward in our Christian walk. We begin to learn how to take authority over demonic things, recognize them, take authority over them, and actually live in the victory of Christ, not only for our lives, but even past that. And so in this situation, I, I was definitely in this contention, definitely in something the Holy Spirit initiated. Basically what he was doing, he was getting ready to heal some land. Okay, and so he found an intercessor, and we went through the strange process. And so, um, uh, but it, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to do these things. This was very new to me. Um, looking back, I would have got some prayer help. But I didn't even know to ask. All I knew was in this, this spiritual battle, and I knew why, and I knew where, and I knew what. And so I began to, to pray as best I knew how. And then um, I remember uh, in the middle of the night, I, it, it, that, that contention got so bad, it felt like I was going to, I mean, lose the battle, like I was going to die in the middle of the night. Now I was thinking, this is what happens to people. They die in the middle of the night. It's a devil, you know. <laughs> and so, um, and that's what I was thinking. And so in that moment, I felt myself leave my body, go to five households in the church, and try to wake people up in that, in that strange spiritual experience. I tried to wake them up to pray for me, uh, five households. And then I came back to myself. 
myself in my own home. And then uh, about an hour later, I felt the peace of God. It wasn't, the battle wasn't over, but I felt the peace of God. And I was so sure that that strange thing happened. I checked, I checked in with people. I, the next Sunday, I said, um, uh, you know, the other night, did you wake up to pray for me? That's all I said. I said, did you wake up to pray for me? Did you wake up? And I checked five households. The first household, they said no. The second said no. The third said no. The fourth said no. This said yes. She said, yes. She said, your spirit showed up in my house, and I knew I need to pray for you. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Okay. So that's what went down with that. Okay. So fast forward. We're fasting and praying now as a church. We're not just praying as a church. We're fasting and praying because this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. We're recognizing, you know, we need to put some, some, some you know, power on this kind of stuff. Um, and so I remember the night that it broke. And I remember praying right in this sanctuary. And I felt it break. I felt it break. I actually kicked off my shoes. I don't know why. I was just dumb. I don't know. You know, it really was just, I just felt the break. I felt it. It was over. And you say, well, how do you know that really happened? Well, you can always point to something in the natural, first the spirit, then the natural. You can always point to something, evidence that it really did take place. And I remember that next year, that whole area began to, uh, buildings were built, schools were built, shopping centers were built. All this stuff began to be built. Now the land was useful and not barren. The land was healed. We have a house there. We have a house there on that side of the city. You know, to the victor goes the spoils, right? Praise the Lord. <clears throat> And I've learned every time I've been in some situation like that, I've been in many types of prayer excursions like that, many, too many to count. I, you know, and they're always different. There's always a reward. Did you know that? There's always a reward. It's kind of like when the Lord told the Israelites, he says, he says, this is your land, now go and fight. What was their reward? They got property. They got land. Okay, um, and so you have to understand that, that one of the things that Jesus gave us as the church to do, okay, one of the things was to actually, um, uh, was to actually advance his kingdom in the earth. And it starts in the spiritual realm, and it, and it involves preaching the gospel. And what we're finding that the God of this age has blinded people from the truth of the gospel. So what happens? An intercessor actually has to pray and deal with the powers of principalities that have blinded people from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's one aspect of it, so that you can actually preach the gospel and people actually listen to you. Right? They'll actually listen to you, actually hear it, because the God of this age is, no, is bound from blinding them, because we took care of that in, in, in the court of prayer, okay, with a plan to evangelize. Okay, we, we, we prayed over the school system. We prayed over the education system. We still do. But I remember we, we just kept praying and praying and praying for our school system. Well, guess what? The one who prays gets authority and gets the windows open and gets the doors open. And now we have kids clubs in, you know, several elementary schools to preach the gospel and teach the kids, you know, the Bible. But where did that start? It started in the arena of prayer. It started with intercessors saying, we're going to pray for education. We're not going to give it away to what, you know, um, the, the, the crazy, freaky liberals are trying to do. Not that I, I'm not against liberals. I'm against the, the, the perverse legislation that comes out of some of these camps. Okay, so I want to clarify that because I'm really not against liberals. I'm against the perverse legislation uh, that just happens to be coming from that 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 area. Um, it, that's what I'm against. And you see that thing begin to trickle into your community, and you know you're going to lose the next generation unless we, the church, the church is the only one who knows how to pray for, for the kingdom of God to come, the kingdom of God to advance, and actually step in and get in there. All right? And so, so you have to understand that we have to deal with it in the spiritual realm first. Right before we went into our first school, I remember we were having this back and forth action with um, whoever would be the deciding factors, you know, in, in the school system to allow us to actually go on campus in such an unusual, different way. And I remember I was going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. First, one day it's yes, the next day it's no, you know. We had our night watch prayer, and I remember we made it a point that we are going to go to the schools, to the educational areas, and we were going to pray. We're going to stake our claim, and this is it. We're taking ground. It was the next week the door opened. See, I'm telling you, you got to understand the spirit of the matter. 
you got to understand, this is what we're praying into. And um, if you don't have my book, get the Intercessor's Handbook. That'll tell you some of the journeys and give you a grid for some of the things that I'm talking about. Um, because I, the things that I'm telling you, we don't just do these things flippantly. We don't do them carelessly. We do them with very clear biblical principles. Um, uh, actually, you know, living a life that, that God can use to actually pray into those dimensions on those levels, okay? And so... Um, you know, so we, we learned that there there is there is a spiritual realm and and the the partnership that the Holy Spirit wants with his church to bring freedom. For example, the prophet Daniel, he saw in the book of Jeremiah that it was time for the for the captivities of his the captivity of his people to end. They were in seventy years of captivity. Um, they were being uh, uh, held by the Babylonians. The prophet Jeremiah said, 70 years, it's over. And Daniel saw that it was coming, so he went to the Lord for, his, for um, instruction and wisdom and revelation about, about what, uh, what, what's next, okay, and, and what needs to happen next. He went to God about this, and he didn't get an answer. That was the problem. He went to God. Prophet Daniel went to God, and he didn't get an answer. And what did he begin to do? He began to contend in prayer. Everybody say contend. He began to go after this. He's, I'm going to get an answer. I'm going to get wisdom. How many of you have ever felt like you didn't get an answer? You're wanting God to answer, and the answer has not come. Let's learn from Daniel here. Okay, so he's going after this answer, and he is fasting and praying. We call this the Daniel fast, okay? Um, uh, this is where he just ate like vegetables. He didn't eat anything that was pleasant, you know, nothing. And, and because he was going after something in God, he had to get an answer. And then guess what happened? The strangest thing happened. An angel appears with the strangest story. The angel says, oh, I was dispatched by God the first day that you prayed. That's, a, that's, that's a, uh, a clear answer for some of you in the room here. I was dispatched by God to help you the first day you prayed. But what happened? He got hung up in the heavenlies by what was called the Prince of Persia. That's a demon spirit. It says it right there in the book of Daniel. Read it, Daniel chapter 10. And he was hung up in the heavenlies by a demon spirit. Like an angel of God could not break through to tell Daniel the answer <laughs> because of a demon. But Daniel kept fasting and praying. A human being, uh, an imperfect vessel, began fasting and praying. And then what happened? Another angel was sent, Michael. Michael the archangel, he is a bad dude, okay? <laughs> yeah, he's the fighter, okay, if you read in the Bible. And, you know, I don't know what he did to that demon, but the other angel got through to speak to Daniel and say, this is what's going to happen. And then, you know, you, you see the whole thing close out where King Cyrus actually releases the exiles to go home and rebuild their city, rebuild their temple. You know, he released them to do that. So, but it had to be done in the spirit realm first. It had to be done in the spiritual realm. All that stuff is happening in the spiritual realm all the time, okay? And, and so it's upon us to learn how to pray and to learn how to navigate those things um, uh, scripturally and properly and yet expect the victory that when God begins to initiate that kind of battle through you, it's because he's in it to win it. The, amen. There's always a reward. There always. I have learned this. There is always a reward on the other end of it, Okay. So anyway, um, heading over into um, Australia, this is, you know, I'm bringing all this to say this so you understand what I do and why I write these kind of books that I do. My next one is coming out in October, Seeing the Supernatural. Um, they actually got on Amazon now. Um, for at least a day, it was a uh, number one uh, new release. I was like, yes, thank you, Jesus. So, so anyway, I'm like, it's not even out for four months, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, heading into Australia, they, it was just a prophetic conference. You know, it just seems so innocent. I'm going to Australia. Awesome for a prophetic conference. And, and I had already planned to go to Bangkok. So I thought, well, since I'm over there, I'll just fly up. Uh, into Bangkok, as very typical, um, uh, Jesus will tell me, go to this place and go pray. That's all he'll say. He, I've, I've done this more than once. And so I already knew I was going to go to Bangkok because he told me last summer, go to Bangkok and pray. And typically, I'll set a date. I have no contacts. I have nothing in place. Um, and the Lord will line it up by the time I get there. And what I did recognize, though, and this is how I knew it was Jesus, is because right after, a couple months after I agreed to go, is the king of Bangkok died. 
And so that means they were going into a time of transition. And when that happens, the prophets are sent in, you know, they're sent in to help the church transition, okay, to, to give them the word of the Lord and, and all of that. So, so the Lord will do that. So I knew that was the timing. But also this other opportunity to do a conference in Australia came. And so I just put it all together since I was already there. And so um, going into this conference a week prior or actually a few weeks prior, I just wasn't feeling good. I remember I was telling my prayer team, you know, I'm just not feeling good. I just need you to pray for me. I'm just not feeling right. Um, I don't know, you know, just just pray for me. And then a week before um, uh, I went into um, uh, Australia, I actually ended up in the emergency room because I couldn't breathe. And so that's very rare for me to actually go to the emergency room. I don't think I've been in the emergency room for like nine or ten years, you know, just you know, I avoid the emergency room, okay, you know, and so, so anyway, for me to be in there, it's really, it's really serious, so I just, I just can't breathe, and um, then I'm just flat on my back for the whole week, um, those of you know me that I'm always moving, I'm always in motion, so, you know, for me to be on my back for a whole week, that's just, ah, uh, you know, just, you know, something's wrong, so I pretty much, um, you know, I, I, stuff like that, especially physical stuff, probably, most of the time, there is some kind of spiritual parallel to it. I've learned to recognize it by now. Um, again, because so many things are spiritual before they're physical. They may, you know, have a diagnosis. They may have a name. But a lot of times, those things have started somehow, some way in the spiritual realm. And so I recognize what this one was. I recognize that I was dealing with what's called a python spirit. Everybody say python. And so where is that in the Bible? Well, Acts 16, 16, the Apostle Paul um, uh, yeah, there it is. Now, as it happened, as we went to prayer, that a certain uh, slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her master's much profit by fortune telling, okay? So the Apostle Paul, um, you know, they're, they're on the way to prayer. That's really key. They're on the way to prayer, and they're met by this girl. And um, if you actually um, uh, look it up in the Greek, it's, it's not just divination, but I'll explain why they use that word. It's actually python, it's actually Python, and it's believed that that was the spirit that was the guardian spirit to the Oracle of Delphi in that area, okay? So basically, a Python spirit um, uh, was uh, guarding the uh, divination that was, you know, accepted and, and uh, uh, you know, leading and directing and guiding everybody in that area, and this girl actually was possessed, you know, showed up to Paul with with this spirit. And so, um, you know, if you read the context, you know, he got annoyed. Anybody ever been annoyed? You know, had that spiritual annoyance when you're about ready to cast out a demon spirit? Anybody ever had that happen to him? Okay, you know, it's this really weird annoyance, okay? And, like, you do something kind of rude. And so um, I've had that happen before. You know, I've, I've just snapped at somebody because they were actually possessed. I'm like, shut up, you know? And, and uh, you know, it's, it's this, but what's happening is you're reacting. You're not being a jerk. You're reacting. So he did. He got very annoyed. He just cast the thing out. Now, you know this is very different from just being a person being possessed by a demon spirit. Jesus said, if you are a believer, you will cast out demons. That's what he said. And a lot of times that would, that would be in the sense of people who have a spirit, you know, possessing them. Jesus would cast them out individually. So would the apostles, everybody else afterward. Okay, this, on the other hand, was different. This would be what we would call a territorial spirit. Going back to Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, and so on and so forth. So there's different levels of demonic spirits, and they affect, terror, they affect things differently. Some affect people, some affect cities, some affect nations, some affect, um, uh, they, uh, they affect um, uh, philosophies and different things that come out that are lies, you know, um, uh, to, to blind people. So, so this is, if you can bring that back up, please. Um, so this is one that was what we would call a territorial spirit. It had rule over the whole territory, much like the Prince of Persia, because when he cast it out of her, the whole city went into an uproar. So everything it was connected to went into an uproar. You see what I'm saying? So it was bigger than just you know, a spirit that possessed somebody where you could easily, I mean, it's never really easy to cast a demon out of somebody. It's always, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, can be difficult. But this one was different, okay? So my point is this. I was dealing, I knew I was dealing with the python spirit because I couldn't breathe. Think in the natural, what does a python do? It constricts you to death, right? Constricts you to death. 
It, it t- you know, binds you. It constricts you. It, it takes your breath away. It, it puts you into what I call a maddening frustration because you can't move. You can't get out of a tight place. Anybody resonating with what I'm saying? Okay. All right. So I knew I was dealing with that. And I knew that, and, and, but I, I hadn't researched the area yet. Normally I'll do some research because, again, this is what I do. And I'll research and figure out, you know, what's happening there spiritually? What am I, what am I dealing with there? You know, what are the, what are the strongholds? You know, I'll just kind of take a quick peek. You just look it up on Wikipedia or get their newspaper or something. You can, it's pretty easy to figure out. And so I realized coming in that the whole area of Western Australia had been dedicated to a python spirit from the beginning. <laughs> I had no idea. They actually have a name for it. It's called a waggle. And um, it, it was uh, supposedly that spirit would show up to the aboriginal tribal leaders and give them instruction and all that kind of stuff. And it supposedly uh, created all the waterways. And so it was kind of a python slash sea serpent, you know, um, uh, that kind of thing. And so that's what I was dealing with. And you say, is this stuff real? It is real, friends. It is real. And so I was not able to breathe. I was dealing with a python spirit. So it's pretty easy to figure out what I was supposed to do there, right? Okay. So I knew, and I, I sat down. I always have a chat with the, the pastor, you know, try to um, get a game plan going. And so we're chatting through some things. And, and um, the intercessors there had already been alerted by the Holy Spirit that they need to deal with a python spirit. It's interesting how he was already speaking to them. And then I told the pastor, I said, well, I'm here to slay a python. And he said, that's pretty bold. No, I really was there. Because if it, when things attack me like that, I'm going to, I'm going to get you. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and I knew that. You know, and again, I, when I make these statements, I don't say it flippantly or carelessly. Like, I've, been, I've done this enough where, you know, I'm just like, I, I knew. I'm like, okay, we are going to put something down. We're going to lay something down in the court of prayer, and we're going to kill this thing, okay, and we're going to stop. And then I had a promise um, from God about it. Uh, Psalm 148 says, says, praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all the deep. So so basically, we're going to put a death order in the court of prayer as intercessors, okay? Um, And then we were going to make a decree that the sea servant, didn't I give you that verse, Psalm, there it is, Um, yeah, uh, Psalm 148, 7, we we're going to make a decree, okay, which is like you're writing, um, you're, again, writing an order in the spiritual realm that the sea monsters uh, would, praise, would praise the Lord, okay? So, so this, this sea serpent, this, this uh, python uh, spirit was going to praise the Lord. In other words, everything that it touched was going to praise the Lord. See what I'm saying? Everything, kind of like the python that affected the entire city. Okay, so, so if we were to insert this promise, everything that the python touched will praise the Lord. That was our decree, okay? And so we actually, um, I actually tested this out the first night that I was there. I kind of like to just check things out. And I basically invited the church. I said, if you have been constricted, can't breathe. And I hadn't set it up or anything. I hadn't said it. I haven't even talked about it. I didn't talk about it until the next morning if, if I'm correct. I, did I talk about it, Catherine, the first night? I don't think I even talked about this. No, I didn't. I didn't talk about anything. And so um, I think I just straight up trained in the prophetic. And so I invited them. I said, now, if you have felt like you can't breathe, if you feel like you are constricted, if you feel like you, um, you know, are, are uh, in a tight space and you can't, you can't break out of it, and I'm just listing all these things, I want you to come to the front. We're going to pray for you. So we had enough of a response, you know, um, and we began to break the python spirit off of them. Um, uh, people begin to manifest uh, uh, somewhat demonically, um, and we begin to, to work people through uh, uh, areas of deliverance and things like that. And so that told me that we were on the right track. And then the very next morning, we had the re- what we call the regional intercessors meeting. That means people from all over who are prayer people. They gathered at this church, and we began to pray. And I just flat out told them, I said, I'm here to slay a waggle. I, this thing tried to kill me last week, and I'm here to kill it. And we're going to put a, we're gonna put a, um, a death order in the spirit realm, and we're going to come in agreement because the Bible says two or more agree, then it shall be done. So we're going to agree on this, 
And I know that God was, you know, God was endorsing all this. We weren't, we weren't acting on our own. I said, and then we're going to make another decree that everything the serpent has touched will praise the Lord. Okay, so we did that, right? We did that. And I thought, you know what? Since this is a sea serpent, that also is uh, reminds me of the spirit of Leviathan. I don't know if any of you have heard me teach on that before, um, which the Bible says is the king of pride, okay? And, you know, basically um, it is actually a, a spirit of pride. And so I just, you know, I said, might as well deal with this too, and, you know, because this thing's probably more of a hybrid type of demon. And I said, so I just listed him. I said, all of the symptoms of pride, and I just gave him this whole list. You know, if you, if you have this, 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 I want you to get on your face and repent because when you are confronted with pride, hear me now, whenever you are confronted with pride, don't resist it. Fall on your face immediately because you're being given a window of mercy. Because God resists the proud, but he exalts the humble. So don't fight it. Don't argue it. Just get on your face and repent. Okay, you say, well, what if I don't agree with it? By the time you get on your face, you will. And so, you know, and I've tried to teach people this because that whole pride thing is tricky. It's really tricky because it's very deceptive and it blinds you, okay? You know, when we start talking to people like, do you have a problem with blame shifting? Do you have a problem with turning it around on people? You know, you, you know can, can anybody correct you? You know what I'm saying? And we start doing that. Like, if that's you, you get on your face now. You see what I'm saying? Because pride is it's very tricky. And when the Lord confronts you, you, you repent immediately um, because you're giving a window of mercy. It is the mercy of God. But then um, uh, you don't want to resist it. And uh, uh, you don't want to argue why, why you're not prideful. <laughs> so, so anyway. But <laughs> anyway, um, so we're moving through, but here's, here's something that I felt that was the big one that I needed to really bring to you tonight. Um, actually, there's two things, but, but one of the things we noticed consistently through, it started in Australia, and we actually saw it in Bangkok, is um, uh, we, we saw this, this manifestation demonically very consistently, and it's something we didn't set up. It's not like we conditioned people to be delivered of a certain thing, okay, with a particular manifestation. We didn't set anything up, but we saw it consistently uh, beginning in Australia all the way into Bangkok, and it did the same thing every time. But we began to see that people were getting delivered from a spirit of rejection, a spirit of rejection, you know, we think rejection, well, that's an attitude, that's a psychological thing. No, it was actually spirit. Every single time they begin to cough up the spirit because it was so deep inside of them. And you say, well, these are Christians. Christians can't have demons. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. Now, your spirit's saved. Your spirit is, is, is totally captured um, and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Your spirit's going to heaven. Okay, that piece of you is set. You know, you don't have to worry. Okay, but the rest of you? The rest of you, you've got to get delivered. Every Christian needs some level of deliverance, okay? And so uh, going back and forth, Catherine and I, you know, we're going back and forth because we have our four doors that we've always preached. You know, it was like occult, fear, lust, and hate. You know, we always say those are the big four doors, and you, this is where we're going we're gonna to look at deliverance points in your life through these four doors. You know, if you have hatred, in other words, unforgiveness, um, you know, if you have an occult history, if you have sexual sin, um, and I lost the other one in my head just now. Fear, if, you have, if, you have, if you're afraid of anything, okay? We're going to go through that. What we're talking about, and Catherine's like, I think we need to have a fifth door. I think we need to have rejection. Rejection as door number five. Needing deliverance. And you know what? I felt like I was supposed to deal with this tonight here. Rejection. Because what happens is we hide this thing. And what happens is when we don't deal with rejection, it, it creates, um, you, you either get like rebellion or you get pride or you get fear. You know, you won't, you won't connect to anybody. You're, you're not transparent with anybody. Um, you know, or, and, and it's very, very real. Okay? Or you think that, you know, I've, I, I've had a few situations where people thought, thought that I didn't like them for no reason at all. And they came to me. I'm glad they came to me and said, I don't know what it is, but I, this voice keeps telling me that you hate my guts. And I'm like, I don't hate your guts. <laughs> I totally like you, you know. Okay, that's a demon. Can you imagine that gets in between your relationships with others? Or you keep thinking somebody doesn't like you? You keep thinking pastors don't like you? Your spouse doesn't like you? 
your children hate you, okay? Or if it's still affecting you, like you can't have certain levels of relationships because of what somebody did to you, right? Or they're going to get you, you know? They're out to get you. Everybody's out to get you. <laughs> All right, everybody's out to jack with you, okay? I've been there. I've been there. All right? It's, it's spirit of rejection, a spirit. And it, needs to, it needs to come out, Okay, and I'm just going to invite you to stand right now. Um, I actually have a little bit more to go, but I think we need to deal with this thing. Okay, and you say, well, well, I don't want anybody to see that I have this. Well, that's, that's not how we do things as a family. You know what I mean? That's just not how we do things as a family. So I just ask you, actually, put, put your hand just right here. Okay, and I'm just, you know, I'm just going to tell this thing to go and just be in agreement with it, okay? So I just command the spirit of rejection to leave you in the mighty name of Jesus. Rejection, go. Rejection uh, that came from past hurts. Rejection that came from abandonment. Rejection that came from church people. Rejection that came from divorce. Rejection that came from abuse and mental abuse and psychological abuse and cruelty against your life. I command rejection to go. Now. Go. Now. Come out. If, if you know this is you, can you come to the front, please? If you know this is you, you know this thing is, is, is gripped you. This, this is, has you. And you say, I don't want to do this. You have to get free. This, you can't be tormented. It torments you. Now, I want you to, re when you get up here, I think we need to do some forgiveness because I, I'm waiting for the break. It hasn't broken yet, okay? But I, I'm going to get this thing. I, uh, Holy Spirit talked to me today. But I want you to actively forgive whoever it was that abandoned you. It could be a church person, okay? It could be a pastor, it could be a husband. It could be, you know, things in the childhood that, like, you, you, it's still, you're still arguing with it, okay? You're still boiling over it. You gotta, you gotta forgive. Let, let, let them go. Let them go. Just do it now. Say, I forgive. Now talk to the Lord. Tell Him, I forgive this person for. I forgive them. I let it go. I let it go. I let it go. I let it go. Kolabash ekete kete. Thank you, Jesus. Korababa. Catherine, can you follow up with me? Just finish it. Right now we just command self-rejection to go. Self-rejection. For those emotions that cause you to just reject yourself, your ideas, before anybody even has a chance right now, I command that to go in the name of Jesus. I speak to self-rejection, and I command it to go. You no longer have authority. Fear of rejection. You must go. You can no longer stand. Fear of rejection, go. Go now in the name of Jesus. 
We just declare it. We just repent of coming into alignment with rejection. We repent for rejecting ourselves and not seeing us the way God does. We are accepted. We are beautiful. We are perfect in his image. We repent, repent. I forgive myself for coming into alignment with fear and not standing in faith. The perfect faith right now in the name of Jesus. Right now, we just command it to go. I accept healing. I speak to my emotions and I call, call them into order right now. Perfect order. We just call them into perfect order. Just go. Jesus. Now. Thank you, Jesus. We're just going to kind of work a little bit here. I don't think this is where it all needs to end here, but... Um, Lord, we just thank you that you're a good God. Amen. You're a good God. You're a good God. And let me tell you what's going to happen. Um, a lot of times we were finding that it was really deep set. So it would be like coming from deep inside. We might have mental thoughts. We are finding it was really deep down. So that's why I kept tapping them on the, t the stomach. Because I knew just from experience that was where we were finding it. Um, but what will happen is you'll, you'll have some thoughts come up. And so what you want to do is you want to take captive those thoughts now. And say, no, I am not rejected. I am accepted. I am received. I am secure in God. I am secure in my relationships. I am secure. And you have to really begin to, to lay hold of that, that thought, that belief that you came in agreement. You had to come out of agreement with it, you know? And you say, well, what if somebody really did reject you? You know what? When we know who we are in God, guess what? We, we don't accept those, rejection, those rejections. And I, I've, I've learned this new thought that the reason we get rejected is because rejection is inside of us. The reason we get offended is because offend, offense is inside of us. And if it's not inside of you anymore, you don't get rejected. You don't get offended no matter what happens. Okay, and that's something we got to lay hold of, that, that I, I'm just not going to have this inside of me. I'm not going to be in agreement with it. Even if something comes my way, I'm not going to be in agreement with it any longer. Okay, uh, and so, so anyway, um, I'm not quite sure what to do. Maybe we should have some music. <laughs> maybe, we have, maybe we should have some music. So, I'll just wait till they get up. Because we're, we're going to have one more piece of this. That's right. We're going to have one more piece. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for being flexible with me. I always wish it could be a little bit more orderly, but that never happens with me. So, <clears throat> so anyway, um, in Australia... Uh, just happen to be be in a church. If you want to sit for a little bit, I'll let you sit, but then I'm going to get you back up, okay? Um, so you can either just stay standing. I won't be long here, but um, so when I was in on Australia, and, and here's something that I've learned as just a person. It's something that I carry, that I'm always a person that can learn something new, um, uh, that I've never arrived, and I can always learn from somebody new. I can learn something new. I can get a new new idea about something, and if, if you'll stay flexible that way, stay a, a learner, you'll constantly keep growing, okay? And so um, when I went into the church, you know, they just happen to really have an unusual intimacy in their environment. Um, they've cultivated a really a strong connection with one another, and they cultivated a really um, powerful intimacy, especially in worship. Um, and it's, it's one, you know, I was in a, basically in my opinion, it kind of, it took me to school, to be honest with you. Not that I don't know the intimacy of God, 
Not that I haven't had great, wonderful experiences in worship here um, and personally. You know, it's nothing like that. There's no complaint or anything like that. I just know that they, they crossed some barriers that I haven't crossed, okay? And so in that environment, you know, I begin to, to really um, uh, just experience the Lord in a very unusual way in regards to worship and intimacy and things like that. Well, that very night, now this is what you want to listen to. This is what you want to hear. That night during the conference, in the middle of the night, the Holy Spirit visited me. And this is where it's really hard for me to even share this, but I'm just sharing it. Holy Spirit visited me in a, like, in a, in a, in a manner that I'm still trying to language. I'm still trying to figure out how to even explain it. I don't even think I have words for it, to be honest with you. But the best way I can describe it is he, he caught me in the middle of the night. He pulled me out pulled my spirit out of my body and he pulled me to himself like he just pulled me right to himself and then when he did that it felt like something dropped in my heart I don't know what that is but when he did that it wrecked me absolutely wrecked me I can't describe the emotions I can't describe what I felt I can't describe what that did I just know that I have been undone ever since and it, it's something about intimacy with God that actually begins to birth nations because every nation needs to be birthed in intimacy we always wanted to get into our authority mode and he's like no you got to get into intimacy mode that authority flows from the place of intimacy that you've got to be a lovesick warrior that if you're going to go into these kind of battles, it's because you love Jesus Christ. Not because you're trying to be high and mighty and all powerful and all that kind of stuff. You know, and these are principles I know, but I've never felt it like that. That's how I say it. It's something I felt that wrecked me. You know, and, and the best way I could describe it is in Luke chapter 1, when the angel visits Mary and he says... Let me tell you what's going to happen to you. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. The power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. And what will be conceived in you is a holy thing. Well, Gabriel said this is what's going to happen, but she never wrote down the event. And I think I know why. Because there's no words for it. There's no words when God touches your life like that. But your life is never the same, and history is changed. You see what I'm saying? And I'm bringing this to you because I have been wrecked. I have been like trying to, to grab a hold of the heart of God in dimensions that I can't even figure out. Like I'm in the Bible, like, okay, how does this all work? What happens? Like this whole thing has got to like awaken in everybody I know because it focuses you. It sets things right. It fixes things in you. It just like in one second, things are fixed. And I don't know how to bring it to you other than to just tell you the story and say, I'm on a chase now. I'm on a chase. I'm on a chase. I brought it into Bangkok. I said, I think this is, this is for you, that this nation has to be birthed in intimacy, the most perverse place ever. The Lord's saying, church, get intimate with me, and I'll birth your nation. Wow. He's saying, he told me, he says, you need to love the new king. I told the church, you need to love, they don't love their king. I said, you need to love your new king, because that's the key. <laughs> this is what God is doing with me, so this is what he's doing with you. Praise the Lord. And so I want to end this time. See, here's the thing. You're getting free of rejection, but it's not going to last if you don't know God's love. If you're not sure of that piece, it's not, it's not going to stay. You're just going to get back into your old pattern. But I am praying that God would meet you very uniquely in a way that would work for you and wreck your world with his love. Because that will make you solid against any whatever anybody says. It'll just, it'll solidify you. So I think we should just worship. I think that seems appropriate. So let's just finish out that way. You can come to the front, you can stay in your seat, whatever. I don't recommend that you